what is political science anyway? Is it a science? An art? If it's a science, what are its underlying laws? And if it's an art, how can we abstract away from one or two purely subjective instances to develop practices that can be applied across a wide range of human societies? These are hardly new questions, and you might be forgiven for thinking that there's nothing new under the sun and no real lessons that we can learn from trying to tackle them again. But you'd be wrong. Mark Bevere, professor of political science at UC Berkeley and a world-renowned expert on the theory of governance, has thought long and hard about these issues and has come down, firmly and clearly, in favor of the social sciences formally cutting the intellectual ties with their natural science colleagues once and for all. For Mark, political science, indeed all social science, is an interpretive art that involves a constant examination of the underlying causes of human behavior, naturally leading us to confront a web of beliefs, desires, history, tradition, and particular contingent circumstances of each distinct human society. But while Mark unabashedly adopts a rigorous philosophical approach to his subject matter, this is hardly mere abstract ivory tower speculation. His convictions carry with them a spectrum of tangible implications, from increased public dialogue with policymakers to a deeper understanding and appreciation of multiculturalism and human rights. I met up with Mark in Berkeley, California. So I want to push you a little bit because you're, you're British, of course, and so you've got this self-effacing, humble aspect which comes to the fore. Um, not so much to, to, to make you appear self-aggrandizing, but I, I, I remember a phrase in, um, uh, in your book, The a Theory of Governance, where you talk about the importance of, the, of, an, of a philosophical approach and you make some remark to the extent, and I'm paraphrasing, so I probably won't get this right, that it would be wise if more sociologists of science would take a philosophical view because they don't often even care about aspects mm -hmm. of philosophy. Mm -hmm. They're only interested in methodology. Mm -hmm. And in fact, for an example, you talk about networks and you say everyone's talking about networks and networks, they don't even know if networks necessarily exist. They should actually pay some attention to mm -hmm. the philosophical aspect of the ontology mm -hmm. of what are these things and do they really exist? So um, that strikes me as a deeply philosophical approach insofar as you're putting philosophy front mm -hmm. and center. Now this is a more academic work and we're going to move on as we talked about before <laughs> in, into aspects that are less rigorously academic. But within an academic context, to start there, you definitely are, it seems to me, consistently putting philosophical approaches, philosophical analysis, philosophical perspectives front and center and it, in fact implying, if not outwardly stating, not enough people are doing this in this particular field. Is that fair? Yes, that's very fair. <laughs> I, I, I mean, uh, there's lots to say there. I think one thing to say there is just something like once a philosopher, always a philosopher. <laughs> once you've learned to think in those ways, you can't unlearn them. Oh, but it's um, more than that. I mean, you actually think that they're superior uh, at yes, some level, yes. right? So I mean, uh, one, one thing is... This is the British thing yeah. that I'm trying to get you. Get <laughs> one thing is just once you've learned to think like that, you can't unthink like that, I think. And, and then uh, another thing I think is if you're talking about the importance of philosophy relevant to other things. Uh, I, ju I just intellectually believe in it. I d so I just intellectually believe that we live in a world in which rigour is almost exclusively associated with methodological rigour. And there's obviously a degree of conceptual rigour that goes into the methodological rigour. You have to understand sure. what the numbers mean. You have to understand whether there's any degree of significance sure. attached to a correlation once you find it. So and how to do the experiments exactly, in the first place. Exactly. So yeah. there is rigour in there. But that's a different thing from conceptual rigour in a, in a, a, at a kind of more fundamental level where you would ask questions like, is the method I'm adopting appropriate to the object I'm looking at? What is the nature of the object I'm looking at? What is a proper explanation of the object I'm looking at? So for instance, if I say to you, if I drop a pen and I say, why did that pen fall down? Right? Then you would accept an answer like gravity. Right? To a point. If, yeah. if, if I suddenly sit down on the floor when we're walking along down the path and you say, why did you sit down on the floor? If I say gravity, you'll think I'm nuts, <laughs> right? Because you'll expect me to give you a reason which is more akin to the reason I have for doing this. Right. So in everyday language, at least, we use rather different ideas of what constitutes an explanation for purely physical phenomena, like a pen dropping, right. 
um, f on the one hand, and on the other hand, for human action. And it doesn't make a great deal of sense pushing that a little further to then get out your methodological hardware and start measuring how quickly people are exactly. sitting down and all the rest exactly. of this sort of thing. Yeah, and and then if it, and within the so it's obviously important because it's only by thinking about those kind of philosophical questions that we can decide what kind of methodological rigor we think is appropriate, uh, to what extent, to what ends, to what forms of explanation. So it's important, irrespective of the answers you come up with, that people should be thinking in those terms, I, I think. And then when you switch and you look particularly at the social sciences, I think this is a bit less true now than it was 10 years ago. But certainly 10 years ago, there was a fashion for people adopting multiple types of different methods. And you can virtually always do that. So you can look at a phenomenon and you can cast light on it by, say, producing a formal model of it from deductive rational choice principles, or by looking at in-depth case studies, or by doing a large-end statistical analysis of it. You can take the same phenomenon and look at it in all these different ways. And there's nothing inherently wrong about that. But if you treat each of those different lenses on the same phenomena as generating an explanation, the type of explanation that is generated will look very different, sure. generally. So if you're offering a model, presumably the explanation is, this is what happens when people act rationally. Right? Whereas if you're looking at the case studies, you're kind of suggesting that you need to dig deeper to see what people actually were doing on this occasion, precisely because you're a bit sceptical of the idea that there's a formal universal rationality that applies to all these different cases. Right. And a statistical analysis would suggest that people act in uniform ways that are patterned, but not ways that are best treated by modelling, rather ways that are perhaps understood by their social location or social position. So each of these different lenses on the same phenomena suggests a subtly different mode of explanation. And it's not immediately clear that those modes of explanation are compatible with one another. So then, then someone's got to come in for, and do the philosophical work of making the explanations compatible with one another. And ideally, it's going to be the author. But alas, sometimes not. And, and is this idea of the necessity of taking a more synoptic view at some point, or necessarily digging deeper, connecting different results in different mm -hmm. spheres with some sort of philosophical backdrop or structure. Is this gaining more credence in terms of its uh, popularity within the discipline? No, I don't think so. No? And are, does it vary so much from place to place? I mean, you mentioned the grand philosophical tradition at Oxford. Mm -hmm. um, can one point to various different centers and places around the world and say, yes, well, these guys look at things this way and that way, but for the most part, there are exceptions to the rule? Not so much. I mean, the root, the root problem, I think, is the division of higher education into distinct disciplines in which philosophy is treated as a separate discipline in its own right. Hmm. And I think that's bad for both philosophy and other disciplines, in this case, particularly political science. So it means that philosophers often are not talking directly to people who are engaged in practices, the practice of political science, or if they're philosophers of science, perhaps the practice of science. And instead, philosophy has developed a tendency to turn back on itself and reflect overwhelmingly on philosophy. So it's become dominated, or again, slightly less true in the last five years, but for a long time, was heavily dominated by issues in metaphysics, epistemology, and the philosophy of language, all of which are issues that are primarily internal to philosophy, yeah. rather than ones that look out to other disciplines. Meanwhile, if you're in another discipline, like, say, political science, virtually nobody who goes through a PhD programme in political science, unless they are a political theorist, will have any training in philosophy. Mm -hmm. And absent that training, they just really have, uh, are unlikely ever to be introduced into what it would mean to do the kind of thinking I'm asking for. So it's a sociological issue. Yeah. Perhaps if we invented a, a discipline of applied philosophy, right. we'd, we'd be better off. I'm going to move uh, progressively, I hope, from the more abstract to the more applied, as it were. Um, but I want to touch on some ideas of political theory before we start looking at the applications and the ramifications for uh, everybody around us who lives uh, uh, in the real world, as it were, or at least most people who live in the real world. So at some point you talked about political science is not a science, 
Um, but it, it's an art. It's an interpretive art mm -hmm. at some level. And my understanding of this is that there is a sense of interpreting, again, these different narratives that occur mm -hmm. with different people in different places and different unique circumstances. And the idea of Im implying that there's some strict law-like mm -hmm. nature to um, the entire study of what we call politics is just a misguided idea and it will never work. Is that reasonable or is that yeah. a simplistic No, notion? no, that's pretty reasonable. I mean, I will, I will qualify the claim that it's not a science. So it depends what you mean by science. So particularly in, say, the 18th and 19th century, science really just meant rigorous intellectual enterprise. And the study of politics can definitely be a rigorous intellectual exercise. And it can also be a rigorous intellectual exercise that's rooted in the study of facts. So in that sense of the word science, I don't have a problem with it being a science. But there's another sense of the word science, where what it would mean to say it's political science is a science is to say that the same sorts of explanations that work in the natural sciences work in the social sciences. And I think that's wrong. So I think the type of explanations we want in the social sciences are different. And I think the reason for that is that in the natural sciences, when you're engaging with the natural world, you're looking at objects which don't have intentionality. Whereas when you're looking at human actors, you're looking at objects, people, that clearly have intentionality and therefore are objects that we assume are capable of acting for reasons of their own, whether those reasons are conscious, subconscious or unconscious. Unlike your pen, as you were yes. talking before. Yes, and I think in everyday life, we all lead our life as if the way we explain human actions is by appealing to the conscious, subconscious or unconscious reasons of the agent. Okay. So if we try to go for lunch with friends and we try to arrange it, we assume they will act on reasons. If we think about our own selves and we're making plannings for the future, we assume we are capable of having reasons. So we live our lives and engage with others as though intentionality is the thing to which we must refer to explain actions. So I think social scientists should do that. Um, and if you do that, if you treat the reasons people have for acting as the causes of their action, then the type of explanation you're going to offer is very different because you have to appeal to people's reasons. The best way to understand their reasons is to understand the location of those reasons in the wider web of their beliefs and desires. And that kind of explanation where you're effectively contextualizing, you're put making an action intelligible by locating it in the context of a web of beliefs and desires, is very, very different from the, what we loosely might describe as the search for invariant laws sure. that occurs in the natural sciences. Sure. So that is in that sense that there's a different form of explanation that's at heart in political science, I think it's not a science. And that also explains what I mean by saying that political science is an interpretive art. Because what I mean there is that to explain human action, we ascribe beliefs and desires to the actor. And that, that process of ascription, of saying when I sit down, oh, he did that because he was exhausted rather than because of gravity, that uh, process of ascription is inherently interpretive. You can't open up people's heads and go, oh, there's a belief, there's a desire. Instead, you're always postulating sets of beliefs and desires to explain sets of actions. And that, for me, is an interpretive act. So I understand that. Um, and I, I think it's very difficult to countenance how anyone can believe that there can be clear law-like regularities in the human science domain as there are in the natural sciences. Mm -hmm. Perhaps some of your colleagues believe that, but I, uh, I personally, as a non-specialist, find this very difficult to believe. And I think most reasonable people would also find that difficult to believe. My problem, perhaps, is, is more in the other direction. So granted, it's very, very different. Granted that one has to take into account beliefs, desires, intentionality, customs, tradition, uh, language, culture, upbringing, all sorts of things to, to get a reasonably clear understanding as to why groups of people on average behave in a certain way, let alone one individual behaving in a certain way. Um, that, seems, that seems fairly self-evident. But the danger, it seems to me, of looking at things, and maybe I just don't understand this, but it seems to me the danger of looking, of emphasizing the narrative aspect, emphasizing the individual, is that it might lead to a sort of all-out relativism, is that you can't say anything 
general mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. anybody, anywhere, at any time. Mm -hmm. You can't compare different human mm -hmm. societies. You just say, well, everybody's unique, different. They all have their own paths. And therefore, we can't abstract away and build any sort of rough models with caveats here, there, and everywhere, predictive models. Um, how would you respond to, to that? And, 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 and secondly, because I like to ask questions in, in all sorts of different numbers, um, have other people even accused you of something like that? Now let's start with your second question. <laughs> yes, lots of people say something like that. So now let's answer it, your first question. Um, I, th I think I have a range of answers. Um, so one answer I have is just that there's a, dis there's a key distinction between abstract concepts that are descriptive and explanatory. Um, so if somebody finds that, let's say, 80% of Berkeley professors vote Democrat, only 80%? I, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to say they're wrong. I mean, that's just a descriptive sure. fact. Sure. Um, and likewise, therefore, it could be a, you could imagine with less rigor having a descriptive fact like capitalism arose from in the 17th and 18th century. Probably true, at least a British society. Um, but the problems are then not with trying to say things abstract, but rather with imagining there's one unique the correct abstract descriptive statement or with imagining that the pattern you find is itself an explanation. Right? So I don't have any problem with the idea of saying, coming up with aggregate statements that clump people together and are not about individuals. I mean, to pick an example um, of a term you use that I use a lot, tradition. I mean, that's an aggregate concept I like. I think people should talk about traditions. I think tradition plays a descriptive role and but also an explanatory role of explaining why people have shared beliefs. So I don't have any prob intellectual problem with the idea of talking in abstract terms using abstract concepts. There's nothing wrong I think with using abstract concepts to describe common patterns. That do exist. That do exist. Where I think people go awry is when they treat those abstract concepts not just as describing patterns, but also themselves as giving explanations of those patterns. Um, as though, for instance, joined up governance can be explained by something like the properties of modern post-Fordist society. Right? So when you appeal to a, a, an abstract concept to do explanatory work, then you need to be careful that the abstract concept you're using is one that can be unpacked in terms of intentionality rather than the one that applies straightforwardly to objective phenomena. So it seems like what you're saying, if I, if I understand it correctly, is one can look and say, yes, there are these, there are these facts about the world that have happened, um, but one can't then go back and actually justify them as necessarily happening yes. from some law-like structure because of the fact that they happen to have happened in this instance. Is that a fair? Yes, that's exactly right. Okay. And the, then uh, uh, another version of the, the criticism of your second question <laughs> that's sometimes thrown at me would be something like, okay, but the, e the kinds of aggregate concepts I would allow for and the kinds of explanations I favor are incapable of generating policy relevant knowledge. So if we want policy-relevant knowledge, we need to operate using more reified concepts. So concepts that use reified categories and do elide individual intentionality in a way I'm unhappy with. And I have some sympathy. I'm not sure how much. I, I genuinely am not. But I have some sympathy for that. I, I think there are times when policymakers need to adopt what we might call rough and ready generalizations if they're to make decisions. Good uh, decisions. Yeah, presumably. any decisions actually, <laughs> good or bad. I mean, sometimes you just have to assume that there's a pattern out there that's going to hold if you're going to make an intelligible choice, but on other times just to make good decisions. But what that would imply is not that you shouldn't have social science like correlations or social science like models and not that social science correlations and models shouldn't play a role in policy making. The point is that we should think of those social science models and social science correlations as rough and ready generalizations. So you're fighting against hubris uh, to a certain extent. Yeah right? absolutely. I, I mean so so and, and too many social scientists either ignore the fact that the knowledge they're offering is at best rough and ready and an oversimplification 
or they pay lip service to that fact without actually taking it seriously. So they don't actually bother to do any of the work of unpacking their rough and ready generalizations in relation to intentionality. And likewise, when we switch and we look at the policy makers, I think too many of the policy makers treat these rough and ready generalizations as though they are scientific truths rather than as though they might be useful heuristics with which to think about a policy issue. So I would challenge both the expert and the policy maker, and I would say the expert think too often acts as though what they're offering is akin to what science is offering, rather than recognising it's about intentionality and therefore about contingency and contestability and intentionality. And the policy maker too often takes what's offered as though it's a scientific truth, rather than as though it's a heuristic that they can use to illuminate aspects of the particular decision they're having to make, but nonetheless, in the end, the decision is going to rest in that particular case and not on a scientific truth revealed by the heuristic. Most people who will casually or maybe even regularly peruse the newspaper and consider themselves reasonably well-informed citizens seem to be of the are bombarded with this notion that we live in a world where one has to make a choice between the free market and consumerism and choice and liberty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or this notion of looking at things from a community perspective, civilization, mm -hmm. uh, civility, community, looking after other people, and so forth. And uh, in its extreme version, that's a state-controlled system that, that enforces equality, uh, and, and the other in an extreme version is libertarianism mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. everybody has free choice. And my sense from, from reading some of what you've, you've written is that therein lies a, a really a false dichotomy. Mm -hmm. and, and that's part of this pseudo-scientific framework, these are my words, not yours, mm -hmm. <laughs> pseudo-scientific framework in terms of these categorizations that seem to be like a law like uh, right. category, but in, in fact they're really not. They, they really yeah. represent these descriptions which hold true to some extent. They have no, it's not as if they have no descriptive power, but to then assume it's either this or that and it's this way or that way and there's no possible way that you can somehow go beyond these, these intransigent categories is a misrepresentation and a deep misunderstanding of, of not only what exists but what could exist in the future. Is that fair? Yes. I mean I, uh, the, I would add to it. But so I think that I think the idea that we live with a choice between market and state um, is something that is peddled in the newspapers. And it's something that to go back to the beginning of our conversation m was paralleled and debated at the time of Thatcher and Reagan and the rise of neoliberalism. And then what you seem to have was a fairly stark choice between something like traditional, the traditional bureaucratic structures of the welfare state on the one hand, and on the other, the kind of markets associated with things like privatisation and contracting out that were promoted by neoliberals. Um, and if we were talking in the 1980s, I think that choice was one that, although it oversimplified, was something that made ideological sense of the public policy debate at the time. What most astonishes me today is the media, and I'm going to, I would add to that, some academics still act as though that's the choice we face. And I find that quite astonishing. And I find it astonishing because no set of policy makers on either the traditional left or the neoliberal right actually believe in markets or in hi uh, bureaucratic hierarchies anymore. What, what seems to me crudely to have happened is the neoliberals tried to introduce markets and the markets failed. They occasionally worked in some areas, but generally they failed. But unregulated yeah. markets. They, uh, well, unregulated, sometimes when you privatise what you got was something that's more like a, an oligopoly with a few firms. But also within organisations, the attempt to introduce contracting out and market-like mechanisms often led to something that would be better understood as packages of organisations all coming together to deliver a service rather than a straightforward contractual relationship. So the market reforms rarely worked. 
and instead what you got was networks. At the same time as this was happening, the, the left was retreating intellectually from the idea that bureaucracy was a good thing. Indeed, many of the earliest critics of bureaucracy had been from the left, and they had seen bureaucracies as unresponsive. And instead, the left turned to networks as an appropriate solution to the problems of both bureaucracy and markets. So if you look at the history of something like the new Labour government in Britain, it's really about the spread of networks, much more than the spread of markets. Their key phrase was joined up governance, building networks across government institutions, rather than marketization. And over the last, what, 20 years, most institute, political institutions in the world have been seeking to spread networks rather than markets or hierarchies. If you just think in American terms, the effect of something like the war on Afghanistan and the evidence that Afghanistan was a failed state led American policymakers to stop thinking in terms of the export of markets and instead to start to think in the terms of the creation and building up of stable political institutions as a, as a context within which markets might work. So broadly speaking, for 20 years now, the left and the right have begun to converge on the idea that we need more and better managed networks rather than either markets or hierarchies. But this is not being described but by this the modern is, media. Exactly. And, and too many, I mean, I'm on the academic left, so I tend to pick fights with people on the academic left because left-wing people are always into infighting. <laughs> uh, but it seems to me too many people on the left have a vested interest in talking as if we still live in a world of neoliberalism. What is their vested interest? Explain the vested interest to me. Is it just, just that they've been saying the same thing for so long that they don't want to change their to, tune? To some extent, yes. Uh, and to some extent also the fact that they grew up in a world in which the right-wing bogeymen were going to spread markets and capitalism en everywhere. And that's what Marxism told us was going to happen. It was that, the, that capitalism would try to spread itself everywhere. So once the right wing stood up with Thatcher and Reagan and said, we're going to spread markets everywhere, then people on the left was like, yes, we always knew it. And at last they've come clean. So there's this kind of emotional attachment to the clarity of an ideological battle that they grew up with that, that is then blurred once you take seriously the fact that actually the right doesn't believe that strongly in markets anymore, or at least not in all contexts. And a lot of what it's trying to do is build and sustain what it would regard as a suitable networks. So, so I understand why your colleagues, sorry to interrupt you, but I understand why your colleagues, or colleagues, you know, writ large, but the media, why, why can't the media appreciate the subtlety? Are they just, are they just not? Do you know, I have no idea. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I think, well, I think one re two, two reasons spring to mind, but they're both just conjectures. Put them out there. Uh, and one is that we live in a, in, particularly in the Anglophone world, we live in states that are dominated by two-party systems. So it's easy to have a market hierarchy contrast that fits onto political parties so that the political rhetoric around the parties Matches. matches on yeah. to the ideological debate you seem to be offering people through your media. And then the second one is that networks are really, really messy. Um, and to try and talk and discuss a world of networks and bring it alive for an audience is very difficult. And I, I, I could get, I mean, I think. Well, first, you have to understand it yourself, you see. Yes, and exactly. <laughs> this is true. <laughs>
Let's talk a little bit more about these networks, because I, I don't pretend to understand the idea uh, deeply at all. Granted that uh, we're living in a world now where networks are a, a dominant factor, maybe the dominant mm -hmm. factor, um, how has that happened? Will it continue to happen? Describe these networks in some detail for me so I can get a clear mm -hmm. understanding of what we're actually talking about. I f always find it hard to try and discuss what forms of governance now predominate because all of market hierarchy and network are at best reified terms that can operate as classifications. It's, it's not like you can point to something and say there's a network. And because you can't point to something and say there's a network in any meaningful way, you can't draw boundaries around a network and say that's what's included in it, that's not included in it, in, unless you do so in an arbitrary way. Therefore, you can't really count them, which means that the idea that networks are proliferating is a little bit meaningless. I think what I would want to say, and this is just a loose, my personal loose impression of government, is that bureaucracy still remains the predominant pattern of organisation within the public sector. But that in my lifetime, what we've seen is an increasing rise of network-like organisations at the expense of traditional bureaucratic structures. So that's the answer to the question of how would I characterise the public sector. On how did this happen, I think it happened in two waves. I think the first wave was when people tried to promote markets. So when people like Thatcher and Reagan introduced things like contracting out whereby the public sector, instead of providing a service like cleaning a, a building, would instead contract out to get a private sector entity to perform that service and pay the private sector entity to perform that service. When neoliberals introduced a contracting out, what they actually did was increase the numbers of organisations involved in providing services and thereby lead to the formation of new networks. Then I think in a second wave, starting in the mid-90s, policymakers became convinced not only that networks were spreading as a result of neoliberal reforms, but also that networks were often a good thing that could help to create greater involvement, that could help to create greater innovation, and that could help to overcome problems, some problems of financing. And therefore there was a wave of attempts across many developed countries to promote things like joined up governance and whole of government approaches. And those tended to consist of the deliberate and, con and conscious construction of networks. So I think you've got networks as a, firstly as an unintended consequence of the neoliberal reforms and secondly as a deliberate policy agenda. So that's how I think it happened. So now let's talk a bit about what it looks like. Um, imagine we go back to 1979 and we live in a society that 1979 is when Thatcher was first elected. And we live in a society with a fairly strong welfare state. And we're interested in the old age care of our parent, say our mother. And our, our mother is, is ill, perhaps she has Alzheimer's. Then in that day and age, we would have gone along to our local practitioner and discussed with them what should happen. And there probably would have been a state home for the elderly. And our mother would probably have been admitted and the state would probably have taken responsibility for looking after her. And that's very simple. Right? We, would have, we would basically have handed the care of our mother over to this state agency, the particular institution for care, and they would have looked after her. Now what's likely to happen? And for many people this will probably ring true. You go to your local practitioner and then a range of other organisations get involved, not just one. Perhaps your mother wants to stay at home, and that's now plausible. Apart from anything else, it's probably a bit cheaper. And then she, but she can't do much for herself, so maybe she needs help in the daytime. So one organisation will provide care. Right? Then if something goes wrong, she has to go to a hospital. So the hospital is also involved in her care. Then perhaps she can't manage to cook for herself anymore. So then there's probably another organisation that's responsible for bringing food in the, at lunchtime and in the evening time. Perhaps she can't manage to walk. So perhaps there's someone else who comes around to wheel her around for a once a, a week outing. And all these different organisations then get involved in delivering care. Right? So instead of having the one bureaucratic organisation looking after your mother, what you now have is this 
package of organisations that form a network that collectively provide this care. And that creates an entire new range of problems in public sector management, most obviously coordination. How are you going to coordinate these different organisations and make sure they operate effectively alongside one another? Let's move to um, both on the purely academic side and on the applied side as to recognizing that the world has changed. Mm -hmm. um, what should we do now? And you have a new mm -hmm. theory of governance. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a whole aspect of this in terms of uh, how you would like to uh, presumably portray the correct interpretation to your social science colleagues and, and how we should best describe what's actually mm -hmm. going on and in fact what we might want to be doing uh, on a higher level. And then there is the aspect of how it would apply to uh, the little old lady who might actually need to have medical care and so forth. So let's, let's, let's look at the abstract level first. So you have a book on the new theory of governance. Tell me a little bit about, um, first of all, what motivated you to write that um, and let's talk a little bit about what the implications of that are within the academic milieu. I think my most general motivation was the philosophical one we discussed earlier. So my, I, I wanted to undercut the idea that you could have a comprehensive scientific theory of governance. Um, and instead I wanted to suggest that you needed to understand the rise of the new governance, so the kind of network organisations we've been talking about, in through telling an appropriate historical story. So instead of saying it arose because of these formal circumstances, perhaps a shift from Fordism to post-Fordism, or perhaps because of the inherent rationality of markets and the inherent inefficiencies of bureaucracy, instead of a story along those lines, I wanted to say the shift from bureaucracy through markets to networks was a consequence of the spread of particular sets of social science understandings. And it only happened because social scientists generated forms of knowledge that suggested initially markets and then networks were the most efficient ways of governing the universe, or at least the public sector. Mm. So at a, at a very general level, I think what I wanted to say was, and I, I, you know, I don't think I ever say this in the book, but I think what I really wanted to say at a very general level was, we're too inclined to think of social science as something that's trying to describe and explain the world as it is. And often a better way of thinking about social science is as something that creates the world. And I, don't, I think most social scientists find the idea that social science creates the world very surprising. But if you stop and think for a minute, it's blindingly obvious. Because every time an idea from the social sciences finds its way into the policymaking world and policymakers act on it, whether that idea is Keynesian ideas about economics or monetarist ideas about the money supply or, or network ideas about network governance. Whichever it is, once the idea makes its way from the social scientific community into the policy making world and then inspires a policy, it becomes real. It becomes real in Absolutely. a sense. Yeah. So part of what I wanted to do was draw out the way in which social science makes the world. So I wanted to tell a, and give an account of governance that emphasised this productive aspect of social science in creating the world. I also wanted to suggest that there was something wrong with all the forms of social science that had made this world. So I wanted, to, I wanted to suggest there was something mistaken or wrong with those social science ideas which had promoted markets and networks as panaceas to the public sector's problems. And I wanted to suggest that those forms of knowledge were rooted in the false idea that you could have organisational theories that were akin to theories in the natural science. Um, and I wanted to say that's not quite right. So although I think, for instance, that these ideas, the ideas of the neoliberals and then net, the network theorists, have inspired public sector reforms, I don't think they've worked as intended, precisely because they're wrong. Right? So although the idea that the, the neoliberals would have told you that introducing markets would create markets and perfect competition. I think that's wrong. I think what happens when you introduce markets is contingent and contestable and it depends upon 
the traditions in terms of which people receive and read those beliefs. So what you actually get, for instance, is gangster capitalism in Russia. And likewise, when people introduce networks, they rarely work as intended because they're read and understood in different contexts. So when you say, but when you say wrong, it means they don't work in the way that they are advertising themselves as having worked. That's an in, uh, when I say wrong, I mean <laughs> philosophically wrong. Okay. So I, I, mean, I mean that they are premised on the mistaken idea that social science can offer accounts of the world that are equivalent to natural science. So they're typically based on the idea that social science is dealing with natural kinds, as though the market was a natural phenomenon, mm. um, or that networks are a natural phenomenon which can be individuated and that have essences and therefore intrinsic properties, which I don't think is true. And that's the first mistake. And the second mistake is the assumption that follows from that first mistake that you can offer similar types of explanations in the social sciences in, as in the natural sciences. That is, explanations that say a formal object of a type A will produce a result B. It will be right. a causal agent for yes, something. Yes, exactly. Okay. And I think both of those are mistaken. So that's what I really mean by wrong. But I think a manifestation of that wrongness <laughs> is that if you introduce policies based on social science, you won't get the results the science tells you you will get. So that's some empirical, quasi-verification yeah, of, of the their, philosophical, of their philosophical wrongness. wrongness. <laughs> yes, okay. that's right. Yeah. So now I'm going to bring it all the way down to the man or the woman on the street, as I promised that I would, and maybe be a little bit provocative. So the immediate thing that I can imagine somebody listening to this might say to themselves is, so what? This is wonderful, this is nice, here's this Professor Bevere at, uh, at Berkeley, knowledgeable fellow, he's got this wonderful interpretive picture as to what has actually happened in the past and what might happen grosso modo in the future in terms of how we're creating mm -hmm. the, our reality in terms of ideas that gain influence and how they may or may not gain influence. Um, there's this new paradigm of networks that I haven't heard of before, now I know of this. 20 years ago it was another paradigm, 20 years from now it will be yet another paradigm. What does it mean for me? What, how, how can I react and respond to what you're telling me in some coherent way? How does it lead towards me living in a world with better governance, more responsive governance? You wrote a book on a, the new theory of governance, you wrote the, the the Oxford University Press short uh, brief brief introduction to governance. You're a governance guy. Tell me how, as a as a non-political person on the street in Wichita, Kansas, or or in Birmingham, or in uh, whatever, or in Calcutta, how can I actually further the cause of better governance for myself and my fellow citizens? Um. Hard question, and, and you're, it not is. You're, not, you're not really in that job, so yeah, well I just, but I'm sitting but next to you, so I thought I'd But ask. it's also hard because I don't know which of several angles to come at it from. I mean, one angle I think would be that the issues that are raised by governance. So once you see that we live in a world where there is still the legacies of bureaucracy, as I said earlier, I think that's still the primary way in which government is organised. And we have definitely have greater contracting out, but we also have a spread of markets. Then you have this complex world, and each of these different organizations or forms of organization in, interacts with or creates a different way of linking the state to civil society. Right? So if you imagine you've got a bureaucracy, what you've really got is a form of command and control, whereby the state will say what will go on, and it, loosely speaking, that's what then goes on. When you have a market, what you're relying on is a price mechanism build, going, working alongside competition rather than command and control. And then in a network, what you have is something like trust and negotiation. Right? Now, each of those models of organisation might be appropriate to different sorts of activities. For instance, if we face a strong internal terrorist threat, or if, say, our house is on fire, 
we probably want something that looks a bit like command and control. <laughs> well, no, imagine it's a market. You have to ring up five fire well, stations, no, 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 find no, no, out no. the different prices they would charge to put out the fire, no. right? And decide which one you want to pay to come and put out your fire. Or if it's a network, you don't want them coming along and all sitting around discussing how best to put out the fire. So there are some circumstances where something like command and control looks really good, right? Then there are other circumstances where markets might look really good. We might feel that we actually don't have many social values that are at stake here. It's not about people's rights. We don't feel there's a need for immediate control and authority. And maybe the market will help to drive prices down, and that's a good thing. Right? In other areas, a network might look great. Imagine that, say, we're talking about international aid. Right? The idea that USA just tells Liberia what it's going to do in Liberia seems silly. What you want is USA working preferably alongside non-governmental organisations like Oxfam, coordinating their activity and also working with the Liberian government, Liberian local authorities and Liberian NGOs. So it seems prima facie that each of these different types of organisations is suited to different tasks. And I think what the, the complexity of governance, when I said earlier that network governance is a mess, part of what that does, I think, is our, get us as citizens to think about what organisation do we want governance, governments to have to civil society in different activities. Right. And there I don't think there's a uniform organ. I right. don't think there's a right answer or a uniform one. You know, some societies might want their old people looked after by the, by the state. Other societies might want their old people to be looked after through networks of organisations. And, and it's not necessarily that one is right, it's that different sets of values are at play. And we as a society should debate what we want to happen in different circumstances. So I think that, that's a one very important thing. I think we should be made, we should think more deeply and profoundly than we do about the kind of values and structures we have and move beyond the standard newspaper binary of market hierarchy itself seen as a all or nothing ideological construct and instead think about what kinds of relationships do we want in what sorts of circumstances. So that would be one very general answer to your question. Another would be um, that I think seeing this as network governance draws attention to a range of problems that can the public sector in particular faces today which otherwise would be inclined to be missed. So then if you are a particularly if you're a policy maker or a public sector worker, I think it can help you the be better to manage your task. So for instance, if you see that we have these mix of strategies, then you will see how important a role for government and for public sector workers is played by the idea of managing them. Right? Hey, managing the mix between markets, networks and hierarchies. And that's a very complex thing. If, for instance, you create a network Right? and the idea is that this is going to govern things, then you lose a degree of control. If then as a public sector manager you try and come back in and exert that control, then you're reasserting hierarchy over the network. So then you have a trade-off and you need to kind of think through which of those trade-offs you want. And once you accept what you've got, you accept, say, I want a network there and all, all your higher-ups tell you you will operate a network here, then you have to think about how to manage that network as best you can or how to manage this market as best you can. So I think it can guide the ways we think about these things. And then finally, I think that the, the extent to which my theory challenges reified concepts and models of social science that ape natural science, I think the extent to my, which my theory does that means that my theory suggests we should stop thinking about the ways of solving all these problems, including our relationship to civil society, including the way public managers deal with their domain. We should stop thinking of these problems in terms of social science giving us solutions. And instead, we should think in more participatory and dialogic modes. So I actually have a personal preference for a fairly clear response to the first question of how do we manage the mix of markets, networks and hierarchy, which is that we should promote dialogue and participation. I know we're talking in broadly philosophical terms, uh, and that's perfectly fine.
but is there anything that one can abstract away from this conversation that might apply more particularly to global governance, uh, uh, pan-national governance, United Nations, or what have you? You mentioned NGOs before. We're talking about networks. Is there anything that one can say within the spirit of what we've been talking about um, that leads to some particular insight on a, on a, uh, on a different scale, on a, on a meta-national level? Mm, I think many of the same issues would arise. Sure. Um, so uh, at a very general level, for instance, I think there was a time, think of when the League of Nations was created, or to some extent even the UN itself, when the only conceivable alternatives for world order were either something that looked like an anarchy of states or global government, where you had formal hierarchical institutions like the League of Nations or the United Nations. And I think one moral that comes across from the literature on governance is that even order within states is much messier than that that it's actually never straightforwardly hierarchical, but also that doesn't mean you have anarchy. And it opens us up to seeing global governance as itself something that is a, a mess, not necessarily in a bad way, a mess that arises out of a mix of some hierarchical institutions, sure. which would include the UN, but also perhaps include regional organisations like the EU, Complex. Um, yeah, exactly. It would include those, but then it would also include networks, perhaps um, say that a network of organisations that will go in and try and deal with um, the aftermath of the earthquake in Japan or the aftermath of um, the Haiti disaster. And it will also include market relationships with perhaps within trading blocks or perhaps more globally. And all of these things are in fact parts of global government and they are all governed more or less formally or informally by human agents. Mm -hmm. So one thing I think it opens us up to is a, a more nuanced picture of what we might mean by global governance. And once you do that, then you're, you open some of the same theoretical questions. So you open up the question of what do we want the relationship to be between government and civil society? In, in the case I think of global governance, that's made slightly more complex because in a way what you're saying is what do we want the relationship between, between global organisations, states and civil society? And I personally often favour something like global civil society and I'm often quite hostile to states, but I think global civil society should interact with international organisations. So I think we face the same sort of moral questions about sure. what sort of levels do we want to be governed by here. And going with that, I think we face something like the same question about imposition, whether we're willing to impose things on people. So just as we face the question of um, uh, we'll have a Bill of Rights to restrict what goes on here, but in this case you're free to make your choices. What do we want to say to whole cl clusters of people, the vast majority of want to do, which want to do something differently? What do we say if there's a society, the vast majority of which really don't want democracy? They just want an, a, a, a stable government that will hopefully help the economy to grow. Or what do we say to a society that systematically, including the women themselves, think women should not be as well educated as men? Right? What right do we necessarily have to go in and try and put those right. I think we often might have a right, but we need to be careful to wonder what it is. And if we do think we have a right, is it one that's best exercised through some sort of global hierarchy, or is it one that should really be done through networks, including ideally networks that involve dissident members of the society we're trying to transform? It's interesting because as you were talking, I was thinking typically we like to think, or at least I've thought uh, in the past, that, well, world government is this quasi-utopian idea, but yeah, we'll wait until we get our national government all sorted out and, and actually functional, and then we'll, we'll talk about world government. So it's, it's so far down the road, I can't even imagine. But uh, according to what you were saying, and at least what, what, what I began thinking of as you were talking, is that it might actually work the other way. You might actually have this, this more uh, tolerant, narrative-based, um, 
elimination of formal social science systems and try applying them, as it were, try applying this, this general ethos towards global government scenarios mm -hmm. with all their messy, complicated players. And then if that starts to bear fruit in some objective way, it might actually trickle down, as it were, towards national governments. Do you understand what I'm yeah, saying? Is that, is, that, is, yeah. that, is that conceivable? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, I, so, I, th I certainly think the following is true. I think that the absence of a global government, the, so the absence of, a, a, of something that looks like the federal government of the US ruling over the whole globe. I mean, obviously, there are things a bit like that. But the, the, uh, basically, the absence of a global government means it's easier to think about being happy with a patchwork of arrangements that are, involve a greater role being given to markets, networks, and particularly, in my case, to civil society organisations. And I also think that the fact that in in terms of the global order, we are dealing with a world of states, so obviously, means we confront more dramatically something like the question of multiculturalism. So we, 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 we confront fairly dramatically the question of what right have we got to make them do what we think best if they don't think that. Right. Um, it's and, immediate. And, 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 and if not always, I think at least at times, we are going to be more pluralistic in our attitude to other states than we would be to other groups within our own society. We're going to extend a, a greater range of rights to them. So often, within the US, for instance, multiculturalism really just means tolerate different groups, but only tolerate them to the extent that they too are tolerating other groups. So you're not really assigning distinct rights to them to engage in practices that we think are harmful and wrong. Right? Whereas I think when we're dealing with states, maybe we would be more willing to do that. So what you have then on the global system is impetuses that, in the case of the fact that we're dealing with states, drive towards a greater acceptance of a pluralist outcome. And also, because there is no overt global government, drive towards a greater reliance on networks and organisations within civil society. So I think there is something about the global order that facilitates the rise of more pluralistic and open patterns of social organisation, for both better and worse. I mean, that should be said. I mean, again, the better is it's more pluralistic and open and people can do what they want. The worse is you're less able to effectively rule out things you really don't like. Sure. But again, that implies some form of de deontological supremacy, yeah. as it were, which, yeah. uh, which goes against not you as a person, but, but you as a philosopher yeah. at any rate. <laughs> That's wonderful. Mark, is there anything that we've omitted that you'd no, like no, to no, ask? That's pretty good, I think. It was pretty good. That's the best you can do for while you're British. I'll <laughs> <take it. Okay. laughs> Thank Thanks you very much. much. Thank, Thank you very much. much.